All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio FM. You already know what time it is. And right here, we actually have a Canadian punk rock legend in the building. We got the drummer of the iconic group, Gub, right here on YouTube and, of course, on the radio station, Airwaves. How are you doing this evening, Gib? Hells yeah, bro. Uh, I'm good. Getting ready for Christmas. Hey, man, I got to... <laughs> I gotta say, I'm I'm trying my best to get ready for Christmas. I don't think yeah. anyone's truly ready for it, man. I just it's one uh, big uh, one big screw around, but you know, you gotta get ready for it. So you're uh, out in Ontario, or Ontario? Yeah, we're uh, we're closer to the Ottawa side, so oh, nice. uh, we are in we are in Prescott, so roughly in between Ottawa and Kingston. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Definitely yeah, I, I, know, I noticed as well. You guys did a show in Kingston not too long ago, as well. That's right. At the mansion, is that is there? I think. I believe so. Yeah, I I actually found out about the show a day after you guys performed. My buddy wow. was like, "Hey, did you go Too to the Gob me. show?" And I'm like, "Wait, what? When, 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 where were they playing?" They were like the mansion. I was like, "Oh, dude, you couldn't have told me. I don't know, 48 hours ago." <laughs> yeah, it was an awesome show. It was sold out. I know that. Oh. Uh, I definitely saw the pictures, man, and I was like, "Oh, dude, I gotta get, gotta get up on my social media posts, man." <laughs> There's so much out there. I understand how you could easily miss it. So, but I, I know you're a busy guy, Gabe. So I'm not gonna take you away too too long this evening. But I, I gotta take you back to the days before Gab, where you were actually a part of the band by the name of Brand New Unit. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about your humbling beginnings as a drummer, and of course, how did you actually get the opportunity to join this band this back time. in the '90s? Brand new unit tattoo. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's kind of a weird long story, but I'll, I'll give it a try to make it shorter. Uh, basically, I was, uh, I'd been called, I, I kind of almost quit the music business for a while and moved back up to my dad's place up in Nelson, which is a small town in the middle of BC. And a friend of mine called me and he's like, oh, you got to come join my band. Um, so he, I came back to Vancouver and then, uh, uh, and I, I was out one night, at uh, the town pump, it was called this very kind of famous bar from the old days in Vancouver. And, uh, I was just checking out a band and just from going out all the time, I'd, I'd met, uh, Kim from spark marker and I knew I, uh, and he, we were out of the show and he's like, Hey, you got to meet Jinx. Because uh, this band, Brand New Unit, is uh, looking for a drummer. And I'd actually seen Brand New Unit play, just again, randomly at this other place called the Starfish Room. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm stoked. And I, I met Jinx. And uh, uh, basically a day or two later, he midnight moved me out of this place I was staying because it was a bad scene. And he like allowed me to live with him and his girlfriend. Uh, and then uh, we started jamming with Brand New Unit. And uh, about a week into that, not even a couple days, Jinx is like, or, or uh, Jinx was also playing in this band called Strain, which is like a, you know, a kind of straight edge hardcore band. And uh, and they asked me, or they needed a drummer because their drummer uh, quit the band or whatever, like uh, not even like five days or something before the tour. So I ended up going on tour with Jinx playing guitar in this other band. And uh, we went to Europe for like eight weeks and had a great time. And then we came home and we just started working on brand new unit stuff. And uh, and that's kind of how it happened. It definitely sounds like just this, the formation of that band was actually inevitable, man. Ine inevitable. It definitely sounded like it was actually bound to happen eventually. Yeah, like, I don't know. It's uh, it's such a, I don't know, it's one of these things I was just telling my girlfriend about the other day. <laughs> it was actually... I'm not the type to cry or tear up too much, but I saw this old YouTube video of us playing uh, somewhere in in Europe, Europe. I think it was Germany or something like that. And I was like, it's a really nice, like really good video. And it, it shows, it's like a full set and it's just us just slamming it. And I'm just like, you know, it brings back a lot of memories for, it brought so many memories back and, and it brought memories I, I just kind of remember Gary, the singer, and I, we would kind of play off each other because I did a lot of singing in the band. And, uh, and you know, I remember just like he's screaming and then I'm just hitting the drums harder and we're kind of just like playing off each other, trying to like almost one up each other. <laughs> but it just comes across like just like the band. It was just like 
I don't know, just really needed to be on that stage. It's like we really, when we were playing and we were, it was just, uh, we put our everything into it and it just, uh, it really meant a lot to me, that band. It meant, it really meant everything to me. And it was really, you know, I was, uh, I was sad to see, you know, when it, you know, kind of dissolved really. I mean, things, things, things kind of went south with, uh, you know, Gary and, and even Ben, everyone kind of, you know, was having substance abuse problems. And, and we'd also been in a van together for like four or five years straight, like for like 10 months of the year in a van on floors, like literally sleeping on stage stages sometimes. And just like, this was like really hard time. Like we really put the time and, and it just, I think we, you know, it, it, we just burned ourselves out. And, uh, and that's, you know, it's just, like I said, it's a, I'm like really, you know, I'm really, I'm bummed. It's one of those kind of like regrets. Like I do, you know, Theo's got the song, No Regrets. And, you know, that actually is a regret of mine. I wish that Browning Unit could have done more, honestly. And one of the projects when it comes to Brand New Unit, I really actually enjoy, is actually in 95 where you guys actually dropped a six track EP uh, titled No Hero. Was I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about this project. And of course, for the individuals that haven't got the opportunity to listen to this project today in 2022, is it actually still servicing the internet to be either streamed or purchased? I think I think you can get all of the everything that's available is uh, through Bandcamp, but also uh, BYO released um, all of those songs on another um, on another record kind of thing they kind of put up it was like almost like a best of brand new unit they chose all the songs that they liked from uh and so they put up there is a i think it's like a 12 or 13 song thing on uh, byo records that you can buy um that has no heroes on it you may be able to still get uh you, like i said if you go to Bandcamp, you can get it all the songs are on there but to buy a hard copy of that i don't think so i think that's you can't do it unless you just like you know ebay kind of thing and I gotta but, say, buying something like that on eBay would definitely cost you a cost you literally an arm and leg. I think it, maybe, maybe an organ. Hundred well. bucks, probably yeah, probably like a hundred bucks or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think about the project. I, I just remember the No Heroes one. We just we it was one of the first, you know, kind of uh, we did like a single, a couple singles, and like, but then that was the first record really that you know I was on, you know, in the band. And uh, I think that, uh, I don't know, we just really, we really uh, kind of always rushed things. So we, we didn't have a lot of money and studios back in those days really cost a lot of money. Like it was, I think we recorded it at, I want to say either Greenhouse or Mushroom Studios here, which is like, a, and you know, back in those days, you know, studios uh, were like, you know, five to, to $700 a day kind of thing. And, you know that and in in those days you know that's like fifteen hundred dollars a day now or something you know it's like it was a a lot of money and so we would go in and just kind of do everything in like one day and you know mix in another day kind of thing and so we you know looking back on it for me i i, I feel like you know we kind of rushed it and i wish that we could have had a little more time and would have been able to you know perfect it a little bit more but on the other hand, I'm like, I'm happy as a, you know, a snapshot of uh, the history, you know, in, into the history of, of that. It's like a snapshot of us at that time. And, and uh, I, I'm definitely proud of it. But like I said, in hindsight, and really having a little regret, I'd be like, I wish that we would, would have had a little bit more time to just, you know, smooth out some of the, the edges. And also as well, a few years after uh, No Heroes, you actually joined the the iconic Canadian pop punk rock band, uh, Gub, as we already know. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about that. And of course, how did you actually arrive, become their, their, sorry, their replacement drummer at that time? Um, yeah, like, again, brand new unit. We were friends with Gob. We played, you know, I don't even know how many shows before I joined the band with them. And I was, uh, you know, really quite good friends with Theo. And uh, even him and I almost kind of like he, he had his girlfriend and my girlfriend were like best friends. They lived together. So we were always like kind of Theo and I were sleeping together, <laughs> but we were like sleeping in the same 
house or apartment quite a, quite a bit, and we were like, uh, we were really good friends. So I was friends with the band and uh, Pat the Wolfman, um, who I'm still friends with. We're um, he uh, he uh, he was having a baby, his his wife, not him, <laughs> but his wife, and uh, um, so they asked me uh, to fill in for this like two week tour or something like that out out east. It was I think probably even in Kingston, somewhere there was some shows out there and uh, in Ottawa and stuff like that. And uh, the shows went really well. It was I was like. I was really impressed. I mean, how many people were showing up? Like, all right, you know, this was after Soda, and this was, I think, it was on the Ass Scene on TV record. I'm pretty sure with another Joe might have been on the on the uh, tour even, and uh, and uh, you know, I was I was blown away. Like, there was like so many people showing up to these shows. It'd be like, you know, a little club. Maybe like it'd be like five, six hundred people jammed into this place, and. And or just these, you know, halls that were just like jammed with kids again. I was like, wow, okay, so this band's doing really well, and and uh, and the shows went really well. And then we got back from the road, and then and then I I, I feel like I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I just feel like Pat didn't want to didn't want to go on the road so much anymore, and the band was like, a, you know, Tom and I. Uh, discussed, you know, that we really both wanted this. Th this is what we wanted to do with our lives. Like, this is what, you know, we were both kind of on the same page. Of, like, oh, we're willing to, you know, go out for, you know, 12 months of the year in a van um, and, and spend, you know, put our lives on the line. And uh, we both were kind of on that same page. And after a couple of weeks after coming back from that tour, they, they asked me to be in the band. And then uh, I, I actually, I think one of the reasons was that, you know, like they had written a lot of the songs for How Far Shallow Takes You, and uh, which is the first record that I play on with Gob. And uh, I think that Pat was having a hard time playing the stuff. Like it was, it was like pretty advanced for Gob. You know what I mean? It was like Gob, Gob was just kind of silly fun punk almost up to that point. But then Tom wrote these songs that are more like, you know, propagandy kind of like, like just more advanced musically, and I think that Pat, what Pat was having a, a little bit of trouble uh, keeping up with it. I'm pretty sure, and uh, I'm, I, I think they, they, you know, they asked me to play on the record, and then I just kind of was in the band at that point. And also, when we're on the topic of Gob Records, man, one of my personal favorite records that you guys actually dropped was October 10th of 2000, which is actually the third studio album titled The World According to Gob. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this uh, album. And of course, what was it like creating the album that would actually change your guys' careers? Because this this album was the one that pretty much got you guys everywhere, like blew you the frig up. Pretty much. I mean, I I, I just remember we, we came, we came, we were, again, we toured like crazy for How Far Shallow Takes You. And uh, so I, I feel like, again, we like did like 10 months straight touring, then all throughout the around, just kind of lapping Canada and the States, the lap, I call it, we just go, you know, lap around and around, kept going. And, uh, and then um, we came off the road and um, I think we might have had like, oh, I don't even know. It wasn't much of a break. Right away, we were into uh, basically pre-production. Like Tom had already had a bunch of songs. He, Tom, always had, uh, always had, and always and still does. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm guessing still that he's writes probably a song every day. The, the guy's like a very prolific writer, and uh, so we got off the road, and right away he started uh, playing us up demos of songs that he had done and uh and we we're like oh my god okay this is amazing because you know it's like it kind of it was going into a more of a way that that uh, you know we were into in a way like it was like you know jawbreakery kind of and more kind of uh jimmy eats world even kind of like more like rock in a way you know not quite as you know fast punk rocky but um more like you know, just a little bit deeper, again, the songwriting. I mean, I felt it was just like we're taking it to another level or Tom was taking it to another level. And uh, and I remember one of the things I remember is, uh, uh, you know, Tom Tom bringing this riff 
And it's that. And he's like, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if we could do this. It doesn't not, this is not God like kind of thing. And I'm just like, dude, shut the hell up. This is it. Who cares what it is? It's like, this is like the catchiest damn thing I've ever heard. You know, it's, and, uh, and, and so I remember him and I kind of hammering out an arrangement and now we were just like, let's just like base everything around one riff. Like I kind of, you know, uh, had at that time kind of been listening to the Rolling Stones a little bit. I know this is kind of weird sounding for punk rock band, but I, I just thought, you know, it was so cool how some of those like 70s bands could make a whole song from one riff and it's just the same riff over and over and, and they just kind of switch the vocal over it or play the riff a little bit differently. And, uh, and I thought that was interesting. And, uh, and I remember, let's just basically, I remember saying that, let's just kind of milk out this riff. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then we went in the studio. I, I remember, what do I remember about the studio? I remember that we, oh yeah, one of the things that we did, we, uh, we, we were with this, uh, we chose the, uh, the producer or engineer, um, Neil King. And he'd, uh, he'd worked on like, Green Day, Dookie, and he'd uh, he'd also worked on that uh, you know that song, Aha, uh, uh, uh -huh, you know, but take on me, and he he was the engineer for that, so we were just like, okay, this we're gonna we're gonna do something with this guy. So this guy, he was super cool, and um, I remember uh, just because the songs again, it was like so easy for me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was used to playing like these fast, super fast songs, you know, and, and then we're all of a sudden, so I'm like, okay, let's, because I always, always, I remember hearing, you know, engineers always bitching about the cymbals bleeding through all the, all the, all the mics, right? So when you record, you know, you have all these mics on all the drums, but the cymbals would bleed, they call it bleed, and that means the sound from the cymbals is coming into the, the mics on the, say, the toms. Or the kick drum or the snare and so this uh, fucking excuse my language engineers that always bitch about that and i always hear them bitching so i'm like so i said to neil king how about this how about we just just record the drums without the cymbals and then later i'll go in and overdub excuse me i'm burping. um i uh oh, and then we'll overdub the cymbals after and uh and uh, he's like, okay, that sounds cool. I've never done that. And I was like, and I kind of just did it as a challenge to myself too. Cause like I said, it was like, it was, I found it, I found it really not challenging <laughs> at all to play kind of these more rocky songs. So I just, uh, I, I kind of threw this extra little challenge in and, uh, and I think it worked out right. I gotta yeah. say, you know, I, I still have that album today, man. You know, I still rock it in my car. Yeah, like it came I love out it yesterday. Too. And honestly, man, going back to after hearing what you just said, you wouldn't even notice that you actually, you know, did the cymbal separately than the regular drumming, man. That's that's definitely some phenomenal production. And of course, drumming work uh, that you guys actually did. Yeah, some of the songs, like, really, it sounds cool. Like, just because the cymbals, like, really stick out. But I remember that, I can't remember what song it is, but they, <laughs> when they were mixing, they kind of forgot to put the cymbals in, like... I swear to God, so there's one on there that's just like the symbols are like not there, and they, you know, I can't, I can't honestly remember what song it is, but I'd have to go through and listen again. But it was none of none of the bigger songs. Like they all, they all sounded, you know, good. But uh, yeah, that was one thing uh, with the with the symbols bleeding through. You know, they were always going to be in there for sure. But with this, my my idea, my brilliant <laughs> idea. Uh, to overdub the symbols, uh, you know, in that one song, it definitely backfired. Like, it's just not there. Because <laughs> they just kind of forgot to put them in there or something. I don't know. On, on my way to work, I actually never noticed that. So on my on my way to work tomorrow, I think this is actually, I'm going to find out what song that is and give, <laughs> it, give it a thorough listen. There's one on there. Now, now you make, now I'm interested again, because this, this, this conversation is bringing that. I totally forgot about that. So I'm gonna, I, now I'm going to have to look into it too. And also as well, one of the songs off the album, I know we spoke briefly uh, briefly on it, was I Hear You Calling. And I got I to gotta ask about this music video, man, because this is probably one of the most creative music videos that I have ever watched on Much Music as, as a youngster, man, where it was you guys versus zombies playing soccer. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about that music video. And of course, overall, who actually came up with the idea for this music video? Huh. I, I, honestly, I can't remember. I, I feel like Tom and Theo came up with the idea. 
I feel like Theo and Tom, like uh, it's, it, it, I'm pretty sure. And I, I, I feel like the guy, the director was this guy called B rad. His name is Brad, but he, <laughs> he called himself B rad. And it was like, uh, and I'm pretty sure that's who, who did the video. And, uh, you know, it was for us, it was like our first, uh, you know, big or budget video. Like, um, you know, I, I don't know how much it costs. It probably costs like 50 grand or something, which was like, like so huge for us, you know, like we were used to like, you know, 1500 bucks kind of thing. So, uh, you know, 50 grand all of a sudden, like, we're, you know, there's a trailer, there's like, you know, makeup people and you know, wardrobe and all this crap. And we're just kind of laughing, like, as if we need wardrobe, we're just going to wear skate clothes or whatever anyway. Right. But, um, and as if we need makeup, I mean, uh, I just remember, what do I remember about that video? I don't know. I can't remember much about it. I remember it was a night shoot, so it was overnight, and uh, it was in it was just outside. Of, I think it was in Etobicoke, or like you know, just outside of Toronto somewhere. And uh, I remember it was just like a long shoot because it went all the whole night. It was like you know, started because they wanted all of the pretty much all of it's in the dark, from what I remember. And uh, yeah, it's all in the dark, so. It was just a, you know, a long, arduous shoot. I, I was, you know, at that point, just more used to, you know, going and playing the song like four or five times. And there's your video. This was like, okay, we do the song. Then there's like a little bit of almost acting parts in it. And uh, it was a, it was, a, it was an interesting thing. I mean, it's so long ago. It's like hard to remember a lot about it. Like, and like I said, I was, it was a night shift and a night shoot. And, uh, and for videos, I, I learned early on that the best way to do them is to like get completely drunk when doing them, <laughs> because it's like you don't have to, like you have to be on like time or anything really. It's just like it's more about just like presence kind of thing. And so, so I would kind of manufacture presence by getting drunk on things always. I don't so, blame you as well, especially if it's an overnight. You might as well make it a party. Yeah, no, it was kind of a party and. You know, I had my my uh, girlfriend out, and it was just like it was just like fun. We just ended up having fun doing it, and uh, yeah, it, it turned out good. And it's funny how many people still really, you know, are affected by that video. It's like, and that song. I mean, this the song was amazing. I I, I really, you know, Tom. I got to give it to Tom, obviously, for that. And uh, I still, you know, it's definitely one of my favorite Gob songs to this day. Honestly, you know, I mean, I love the fast punk rockers up and how far shell takes you and. You know, I like, you know, I love the whole record from Muertos Vivos, but if I had to, you know, sum up Gob, my favorite Gob is, is, is that song. I hear you call him really. I, I, I think truly that's the best song song that there is that, that he wrote. I got to say mine of all time is always give, give up the grudge, man. That's yeah. no matter where I am <laughs> gets me just right. I saw right you, up. I saw you put that on the, uh, you know, the trailer kind of thing for this. Not yeah, well, once not. I once I once I booked booked you, I was like, oh man, what what video am I gonna use for use? And I literally went back, and all all that I heard was "Give up the grudge, shut your fucking mouth." I'm like, yes, <laughs> just like yes, <laughs> that is the promo. <laughs> Sounds good, man. But also as well, a couple years after that, in 2004, you guys were actually did a cameo in a National Lampoon's uh, movie by the name of Going the Distance. I was wondering <laughs> if you can actually tell us a bit more about that particular role, and of course, what was it like just actually. Do we doing a cameo on on that particular film? <sighs> okay, well, yeah, <laughs> that was again, like I told you, my theory with the. I mean, we only just had to play our, ourselves in it, so I mean, there was no acting involved. So again, like I, <laughs> I, I like I, I basically got drunk for the whole thing, and uh, I remember I was hanging out with. Uh, I'm pretty sure the swollen members are on there. Because I know for a fact that Pre Pre I was hanging out with Prevail that night, and uh, like uh, you know, there was a break for shooting, and we were in Victoria, and we went to a, a stripper bar. <laughs> and if you go to a stripper bar with those rap guys, it was uh, it was another another experience that I can't even I can't say that I'll never be able to say it what what it was like or how it was or what happened but i'll tell you this uh it was a quite an experience and we kind of got like we got you know things got out of control and we lost time and they had to like the production was like ground to a halt because prev and i were like drunk in a stripper bar <laughs> so they got us back and uh 
they got us back and we just again i just it was real easy acting yourself so and i i just i remember i you know again this is one of these things i i we'd never really you know never had money or anything now to be in this kind of like big budget movie and you know you got your own dressing room kind of thing and you got like you know uh you know catering and and then uh you know, and my own hotel room and all that shit. And I was just like, ah, I've made it kind of thing. It was pretty cool. But then, uh, you know, later when the check came for it, like I was just stunned. I'm like, oh my God, I, I think it was like, I don't know what it was. It was like 10 grand or something. It was like, I got a check for 10 grand. Like at that point I was just like, that was like, you know, life changing money. So I was just like, oh man, I want to be an actor. <laughs> if that, if you could make money, you know, if I could only just make money being myself, then that would be great. Especially, you know, that kind of money. I mean, it was, like I said, it was like 10 grand for like an afternoon of getting drunk. I was That's like, okay, def definitely easy this money. Is, yeah, this is my kind of job. And also as well, speaking of acting and whatnot, you also actually lent your voice to the Canadian animated cartoon of Being Ian. I was wondering, of course, obviously you talked about, you know, being yourself and acting. What was it like actually just doing voice acting for, for a cartoon? Actually, that was an interesting experience too. It was a, you kind of, I remember that they, you know, they kind of, you know, I, I can't remember who the producer or anything about it at all, other than I remember doing it. And I remember them saying like how you kind of have to over, uh, you know, enunciate and over act, even though, again, we were just playing ourselves. They really wanted us to like, be like, okay, bah! you know, you like, like got to be animated for real, like not just animated, but you have to, you know, act animated too, or like your voice needs to be animated. So you kind of had to really, you know, this wouldn't work. This like kind of low key, Hey bro. But I'm doing it. Hey, bro! Yeah, man! Let's do this! <laughs> That's kind of what they want on the... On the Just straight amped. Yeah, they want you <laughs> amped, and they want to kind of, you know... So, it, again, it was a pretty easy gig, and I remember, again, opening up the check, and I was like, oh, my God, I was like thousands of dollars for this, like, few hours in the thing. I'm like, oh, my God. What a, what a, what a scam these actors got going. <laughs> And when you actually like got, got done doing that, did you actually turn on the cartoon? I, I think that show aired on Teletoon. It's been so many damn years since I watched any of those shows. But did you yeah. once it came out? Did you ever turn on Teletoon and actually be like, hey, you know? Yeah, I no, check it, out it happened. It happened like even like I don't know when my you know like years later when and I had a, a son, a young son, and he'd be like watching Teletoons and it would come on. He's like, Dad, that's you. It would came like they kind of played it for. You know, ten years after, even kind of thing, and uh, and so it was. Uh, yeah, it was on there for a while, and uh, it was. Uh, it was really, really neat. It was very cool to see yourself like that, and uh, I loved it. I, I'd, I would love to do something like that again. Like I said, I got to get that that check. <laughs> I got to say, an afternoon of just lending your voice again, thousands of dollars, man. That's easy rent money, especially during inflation, man. And people that are listening, if you got a cartoon. Gob's interested. Hit him oh, up. Oh, yeah, man. You know you know what? We'll do it anytime, man. I'll, I'll do it for free now. That's the thing. I don't, it's not so much about the money ever. Not, not that it was ever. It was never about the money. But then all of a sudden, it just kind of, we're getting money for these things. I'm just like, okay, wow. And uh, Hey, if they're going to give it to you, might as well take it. Yeah, I was taking it. <laughs> but also, as well, the timeline a little bit on 20. Fifth, released the phenomenal 13 track album and the most recent album, Apartment 13. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about this record. And of course, is there plans to actually have another brand new Gob album in the future? Because I do know, you know, uh, Tommy's currently doing it uh, with Sum 41, but is there plans for more Gob? Okay, well, I'll start with Apartment 13. Um, it was a it was a different one for us. Like we every other time we'd like been together on the writing process kind of and like kind of got to hammer them out um with tom and kind of you know in a way like arrange the songs together and even kind of put our two cents worth into it and it felt weird because it was like tom was busy with some 41 this time really and uh so basically he sent the demos i guess he thought were good and we chose the songs out of it that we all thought were good out of it and we 
went in and recorded them. I mean, that was kind of how it was. And, uh, and it was just, a, it was, a, I, like, to me, again, like, you know, hindsight 2020, I wish that we could have, you know, gotten in a jam space and hammered the songs out for a month kind of thing. And we really didn't get to do that. And, uh, and uh, so for me, it, it lacked a little bit on that. But uh, um, honestly, I, I was really, I'm actually quite happy with the way the record turned out. And there's a lot of good songs in there. So, um, but in the future, for the future record, uh, you know, uh, Tom and I, I and Theo and Stephen have all, uh, you know, said that we want, we would like to, you know, go back to the old way, kind of where, you know, where we kind of like, you know, jam the songs out a bit and kind of, uh, you know, more of the natural way that things used to be back in the day. I don't know. Now it's like just people send files back and forth and oh, there's your record, but. I like I like that old old school style of uh, you know you get together in the jam space and you hammer it out like and that's that's what we're gonna try to do again and I mean th there hasn't been any talk of a new record yet what we're talking about now is uh, re-releasing um, they're gonna re-release -re uh, how uh, too late no friends uh, on vinyl and uh, and I I think maybe how far shall it take you I, I, we're trying to get uh, like as many records as we can re-released on vinyl um, because we get like such a demand for it. People really ask for it a lot. And, uh, and uh, so that's, that's the next thing in the works. Hopefully that's going to happen in the next year or two. I guess vinyl, vinyl pressing uh, has been a lot harder lately. It's just been a big lineup to get in and, you know, things uh, to get a, a record press now takes a lot longer than it used to. It's like a an eight month delay or something for a, for a, yeah where it used to be you just you know you could basically send it in and it'll be pressed in a month kind of thing but now it's like eight months or a year so I think that's one of the issues is taking it up taking so time so much time and uh, and I don't know yeah you know, we haven't talked about a new record but I know I can I can feel it in my heart that there's a, a there there's a you know there's a there's a new record in us still I feel like we got. I think I feel like Gob has a couple more records still in in him, and it's just really uh, I think it's a I think it's a you know a matter of finding the time for Tom essentially. I mean Theo uh, and uh, Stephen and I we're ready to go. So whenever Tom uh, you know gets a minute from his band his other band you know his day job essentially is some forty one. So he's got to he's got to go do his job and he's got to pay the bills. So I understand that and I. But uh, I, I hope that, uh, you know, he, he, when he gets a chance, that we'll uh, get together again and, uh, and do another record. Like I, like I said, I feel there's a couple more left in us. And, uh, and uh, hopefully next year we want to, we, I know that the band wants to do it. It's just, like I said, it's a matter of uh, logistics and finding the time. So. Oh, definitely. And I agree, especially when you said a few moments ago as well about, you know, being in the studio and actually jamming and doing the songs rather than versus versus sending files. I've heard a lot of stories from other bands as well that it, it doesn't they, the chemistry on the album kind of feels a lot different when you actually listen to the sending files type projects, you know. Uh for instance, one of them kind of like Blink 182 Neighborhoods, they were sending files. It sounds great, but this is a part of it where you sit back and go, it's definitely lacking something. So I really do hope that you guys can actually get back in there and jam on this next up and coming project. It'll happen. I mean, basically Theo and I have decided that, you know, we're not going to do it again like that because we're not, we weren't 100% satisfied. Like every other record, when we put it out there, I was like 100% satisfied. But for me, that apartment 13, I was like, ah, there's something not quite there. And, and I feel that that was the thing. Like, you know, I felt like, I felt like it was missing that, missing that like human, you know, humans reaching out and touching each other element. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm sure for the next one, we'll make sure that we, uh, we grab Tom off the Sum 41 train and wrestle him down to downtown Vancouver and we'll, uh, we'll uh, jam it out. And also as well, I actually saw, aside from Gub and everything else, I saw that you actually have a collaboration coming out soon uh, with uh, the Surrey BC band Not In Public on the project titled uh, Half Measures. I was wondering if you can actually, uh, what, from what you are allowed to speak about that is, can you tell us a bit more about this 
this up and coming release. And of course, what can us fans actually expect from it? Um, yeah, those guys, uh, I feel was the, is the engineer on it as well as he plays, plays some guitar on it and maybe even some, I'm not sure what, what else he's playing on it, but he's, uh, he was, uh, you know, a part of the project with uh, our friend Kyle and, uh, and Ryan. And those guys, uh, I don't know, they came to me and they said they wanted some drums. And I'm like, sure, man, I'll do it. I was stoked. I mean, I heard the songs and and they're ripping. Like, the songs are like, anyone who likes ripping, you know, raging punk rock is going to like it. It's because that's what it is. And, the, you know, the songs are the songs are, are really good. And it sounds incredible. I feel feel really crush it on the uh, on the on the engineering of it and the, the mix and the production it sounds uh it sounds great and uh, and kyle kyle's vocals on it are just like he sounds like he's you know he's like it's just it's like his, his vocal cords are getting shredded and ripped right out and it just sounds so awesome it's like that right on the edge vocal performance that i i like it's like it's just like he's just pushing it right to the limit and it and uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually really quite happy the way it turned out. I I don't know. I, I'm not sure if we're if I'm going to do any shows with them or not. I'm not exactly sure about that. I might. I might not. I mean, I'm. They haven't asked me. How about that? <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe. And um, I'm also working on a, a new uh, buy a thread record, which is a uh, uh, old friends of mine from Vancouver and. Uh, and uh that's that's gonna be that'll be out next year sometime too and as well um i'm playing with this other band called precursor we're like a, a super fast punk rock kind of emotional punk rock it's like i don't know it's it's crazy so we're doing uh, i'm gonna have that record coming out next year too so i'm gonna be busy doing that stuff and uh and hopefully a new gob thing and at the very least, some re-release stuff. So we're going to do some, uh, we'll get some touring down across Canada. And uh, hopefully you'll see us out there sooner than later. Hey, most definitely. And this time, I'll make sure that I actually have, though I actually have the notification set. So I don't find out about the show, I don't know, a day late. Yeah, no, for a, sure. That was a kick in the nuts. <laughs> well, I'll let you know how about that. And uh, and then maybe we could set up, like, maybe you come out and do, like, a, a, a remote kind of uh, interview or something like that with us and come hang out or whatever. Hey, definitely sounds good to me. Honestly, I, I can't complain. You know what I mean? If you you message me, we'll definitely set it up and we'll uh, we'll definitely uh, talk about that. It sounds good. But also, I got to say, Gabe, before we actually part ways, man, because yep. obviously, you know, I know how to find you on social media. But for, yep. the, the, for the fans that are watching and want to actually follow <laughs> yourself and, of course, Gub, how, uh, can, can you actually give us your social media handles? That way we can follow you guys all across the board. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know. What is my name? I think it's just Gabe Mantle. Uh, uh, you know, on there, just look, search out Gabe Mantle on there. I think you find it. Hey, most definitely. Google is everyone, everybody's best friend. In my yeah, you'll opinion. find me. You find me on there. I mean, just go go to Gob, and then you'll find you'll see you'll see the band members on there. And if you want to follow me up or say hi, I'm uh, I'm there. Message me up, and uh, when we can uh, we could we could be uh, Facebook message pals. And I got to say, first and foremost, Gabe, thank you so much, man, for just giving us a bit of your time here this evening and just chopping it up with a, with a fellow Gob fan, man. It's so, it was such an honor to speak with you. And just I, I even learned some stuff about you guys that I didn't know as a lifelong fan. So for that, thank you so much for your time. And hopefully down the line, we can actually do this again sometime soon. Sounds good, brother, for sure. Again, when we have a new Gob thing come out or whatever, we can uh, get together. Maybe maybe even uh, Theo and I or, or you or do something with Theo or something, but well, definitely uh let's uh let's let's stay in touch thanks a lot man i appreciate your time too brother hey man you are most certainly welcome and you, you and thank you again man we'll definitely speak soon but for now yeah. definitely have yourself a phenomenal night gabe peace brother have a good one you as well